This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. In a personal essay called Proving My Blackness, my guest Matt Johnson wrote, I grew up a black boy who looked like a white one. His African-American mother, an Irish-American father, divorced when he was four. He says, I was raised mostly by my black mom in a black neighborhood of Philadelphia during the black power movement. So there was quite a contrast between how he saw himself and how others saw him. Race and identity are also themes of his novel, Pym, and his comic book, Incognito. The main character in Johnson's latest satirical novel, Loving Day, is a comic book artist named Warren, who, like Matt Johnson, is biracial, but to many people looks white. When the novel opens, he's newly divorced and has just returned to Germantown, the Philadelphia neighborhood where he grew up. His father, who just died, bequeathed him a huge old wreck of a mansion in Germantown that he bought at an auction but was never able to renovate. A mansion in the ghetto is how Johnson describes it. Warren doesn't know what to do with the mansion or his life. The book's title, Loving Day, refers to the day of the Supreme Court's 1967 decision, Loving v. Virginia, which struck down all laws banning interracial marriage. Loving Day was just published in paperback. This interview was first broadcast last year when the novel was published in hardcover. Since then, Matt Johnson has become a Fresh Air contributor. Matt Johnson, welcome to Fresh Air. I'd love to start with a reading. So this reading happens when the main character is at a small comic book convention, and he finds himself placed on the panel of African-American comic book authors. And he knows because he looks white um, that people will assume, like, what is he doing there? And in fact, somebody asks, like, what are you doing on this panel? And if you could pick it up from there. Why am I at the black table? I'm a local writer just back in town, you know, peddling my wares, I tell him then babble on a bit more, eventually get into my name and the last book I worked on. The words don't really matter. What I'm really doing is letting my black voice come out to compensate for my ambiguous appearance. Let the bass take over my tongue. Let the south of my mom's ancestry inform the rhythm of my words in a way few white men could pull off. It's conscious, but not unnatural. I sometimes revert to this native tongue even when I have nothing to prove, often when I've been drinking. I refer to my last graphic novel with the pronoun John. I finish what I'm saying with, know what I'm saying? He nods at me a little, slightly appeased, because he does know what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, I'm black too. What I'm saying is that he can relax around me because I'm on his side. That he doesn't have to worry I'm going to make some random racist statement that will stab him when he's unguarded or be offended when he makes some racist comment of his own. People aren't social. They're tribal. Race doesn't exist, but tribes are effing real. What am I saying? I'm on Team Blackie. And I can see in a slight relaxing that he's willing to accept my self-definition, at least tentatively, pending further investigation. And that's Matt Johnson reading from his new book, Loving Day. So why don't you describe how you look and how your character looks? I look, I like to say I look white. And partly the reason I like to say it is as soon as I say it, 20 people point out, actually, no, you don't. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So I look like a pale Puerto Rican. Um, I look like a really ragged ex-Latvian rugby player. Um, I've been told I look Egyptian. I've been told a lot of things, but really what I I look is ambiguous. You know, I have skin the same color as most or many uh, white people. I have an African nose. I have high cheekbones. For some reason, people always assign high cheekbones to some ethnicity, but apparently by their regards, everybody on earth has high cheekbones. So I don't know if that matters, but I look white to a lot of people and um, I'm not. I'm African-American. I'm mixed. I like to call myself a mulatto because that definition fits. So, you know, I've dealt with the conflict my whole life between how I look and my actual ethnic uh, and racial identity. You're a big man, too. You're, what, six foot four and about 225 pounds? (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you add all all this. You can add on to the fact that I'm huge. Yeah, I'm six foot four. (laughs) Um, It says 225 in the book, but, um, you know, this is a novel, so I I got to cut off some pounds there. Um, But... (laughs) Yeah, so that's that's part of the whole presentation. 
So in the passage that you just read, the character is using his like southern, deeper, blacker voice to compensate for the fact that he knows some people think that he looks white and therefore is white. How many languages do you think of yourself as speaking? Yeah, within English, you know, I speak a, a lot of them. I, I mean, I, I, again, I keep coming back to this idea of tribes. And, you know, I speak like my mother, you know, who is Midwestern, African-American. I speak like my neighborhood um, in Philly, in Germantown mostly, um, African-American section of Philly. But I also speak, um, you know, the way my father speaks um, when I'm at his house. And that's as an Irish-American in Philly. And, you know, and then I also have my my nerd um, and other tribes as well. So I code switch, which almost everyone does. You know, you code switch with, between the way you talk with your friends and the way you talk with your grandmother. But my code switching um, has been because I've traveled in, in worlds that were fairly different. One of the characters in your book who's a friend of the father's, uh, a character named uh, Sirleaf, speaks three languages, street, Caucasian, and brother man. So what's the difference between street and brother man? Well, street is, is the lump and proletariat. You know, street street is, you know, what would be defined as ghetto. But Brother Man is an elevated um, level of speech. In his case, it's Afrocentric. It's somewhat intellectual. There's a class difference there, too. And there's an education difference between them. You know, and one of the things that, that I think the mixed identity speaks to is that African-American culture is not monolithic. And I think that's something I had to realize early um, as somebody who's trying to negotiate those worlds and, and to be honest, like constantly overcompensating, um, you know, trying to fit in. So we'll get back to being biracial, both you as a person and the character in your book. But the character in your book returns to Philadelphia at the very beginning of the book, to the neighborhood of Germantown where he grew up, to take over a dilapidated old mansion that his father bought as this like giant-sized fixer-upper that he never fixed up. The father has died, so this is his legacy to his son. There's no roof <laughs> over this mansion. Right. It's just like, yeah. you know, walls and interior. So he, he, he sleeps in a... You know, the main character ends up sleeping in a tent in this yeah. dilapidated mansion. So what were you thinking of in terms of a, a building or a mansion in the neighborhood where you grew up that made you well, think I mean, of there, this there's for an the actual, book? Yeah, there's an actual building, Loudon Mansion, which is in Philadelphia on Germantown Avenue, right past Wayne Junction, the same place it is in the book. And I used to grow up uh, walking around in that area and, and seeing that. But really, it's just the Germantown section of Philly, which has this kind of amazing history. At one point, it was its own town separate from the city. And at that time, it had these huge grand mansions because it was a you know country resort area. And then slowly, it became incorporated into the city. And by the time I got there, it was a majority black working class area that was filled with these huge mansions that were left over by a white upper class that had long since abandoned the entire place. So a lot of them were cut up into multiple apartments. Every once in a while, there'd be some kooky guy living in this, you know, uh, 5,000 square feet, you know, 200 year old house um, <laughs> that with a lot of cats and <laughs> things like that. And the crazy thing was when I started writing this book, I actually was writing about Germantown and I was trying to figure out why am I stuck on Germantown? Because I haven't lived there in a long time. You know, I still have family there, but but I'm not there. And I realized that it wasn't just my connection to where I grew up. It was also that Germantown was a physical representation of my ethnic identity. And this this contrast between European culture and African culture, and this contrast between wealth and poverty, and this overwhelming weight of history. You know, I'm in Houston now, like, you know, a house looks at you wrong in Houston, it's a parking lot the next day. You know, in Philly, it doesn't matter how wretched a house is, <laughs> chances are it's going to be there forever <laughs> because we just don't think like that. We just fix up these houses and they stay there forever. But you're constantly steeped in history in Philly. And I started to appreciate that more and more as I got older and realized how much that actually affected, you know, the way I looked at myself. So your character returns to Philadelphia, to the Germantown neighborhood where he, he grew up after having lived in Wales. And he returns because his father's died and he's taking over his father's dilapidated uh, mansion. And so when he gets to Germantown, it's just like this whole different culture that he's been away from for so long. 
And there's a description in there of getting out of the taxi when he first arrives back in the neighborhood and, you know, getting onto the street. Would you read that for us? Sure. Welcome home. There are blocks around here where you can be attacked for looking another man in the eyes. And other blocks where you can be assaulted for not giving the respect of eye contact. I can never figure it out. Which blocks were which? Until I realized these were just the excuses of sociopaths. The sociopaths. That's the real problem. The whole street demeanor is about pretending to be a sociopath as well so that the real ones can't find you. I love that paragraph because I, I think so many of us have gone through this of not knowing when you're supposed to make eye contact, when when oh, is God, that a sign yeah. of respect, and when is it a sign of disrespect, and it gets well, it's like, it's like it's a confusing and scary, actually. Oh, totally. And it's it's like when I lived in a, a, Alaska briefly, it was like a bear attack. You know, you get the advice from people. How do you deal with bears? Well, you just lay down and you just play dead. <laughs> and the next person will be like, you raise your arms in the air. You know, the next one's like, your only chance is to run. You know, the problem <laughs> is not that there's some secret for how to deal with it. The problem is that bears eat people, you know. And I think like within that, that world, you know, I was always worried about that. Especially like looking different. In any situation, when you stand out as looking different, you immediately visually tell people that you uh, might not know where you are, you might not um, have the ability to fight back, and you might be generally disoriented. So, you know, I was always kind of compensating for that. Now, everyone was, like all my nerd friends, uh, you saw them on the street. They looked like, you know, the roughest guys you ever saw in your life. Then you go to their house and their rooms would be covered with Princess Leia posters, right? (laughs) But like... On the street, we, had, we everybody was like pretending to be that way, and the real situation is is the larger society, and and you know how we are going to negotiate in a way where we're not going to get you know mugged. Your character, your main character, finds out once he returns to Germantown, Philadelphia, that he has a teenage daughter. It turns out that when he was a sophomore in high school, he had a one or a two night stand with a teenager who he didn't realize was only 14 at the time. And it turns out that she was pregnant and kept the baby. And this now teenage girl approaches him. And I'm wondering if this plot point connects at all with your life. Did you ever worry about that? Maybe you had a child out there who you didn't know about? Yeah. Um, I, when I started the book and I started figuring out what it was about, I already started thinking about this moment when I was 16 and I had a pregnancy scare with a girl for one of the first, you know, I probably the first girl I was with and it changed my entire life. You know, I was, I was a gregarious, probably good looking kid. And all I did was run around center city Philly on my skateboard. And then I would lie to my parents and say, you know, I'm going to my dad's house to my mom and I'm going to my mom's house to my dad. And then I'd stay out as long as I could. Invariably, I get caught. But, you know, for a while it would work. And then, you know, I was kind of living this wild life and it all smacked into me when I realized this might have happened. Then later, you know, it was pretty clear it, it probably wasn't true and it was being used for other reasons. But it didn't matter because... As far as I was concerned, I had learned that I was not emotionally prepared to be sexually active. And I started changing the way I lived and changing the way I looked at women and changing the way I looked at myself. And uh, I, for the next couple of years, I pulled into this bubble and I started becoming an introvert. And that's when I started reading. And uh, I always read comic books, but then I figured out for the dollar you spend on a comic, you could buy a whole novel. So I would start getting into novels. And then I read things, you know, first science fiction and then things like Joseph Heller's Catch-22 and, and Morrison's Beloved and Souls of Black Folk. And this whole world opened up to me. And so I've thought about it since and I wanted to negotiate what would have happened if my life had been very different. So let's get back to your novel. The main character finds out that he fathered a child after a a kind of one-night stand. And the woman who he had this relationship with was was white. She was Jewish. And the daughter has been brought up white. The mother's now dead. And for reasons too complicated to get into here, the daughter ends up living with the main character. 
And um, he thinks that she should go to an Afrocentric public school because she needs to learn about the African-American side of her heritage. And she didn't even have a clue that there was an African-American side to her heritage. And her attitude is, well, I know who I am. Do I need a new identity? So what do you think would have been right and what do you think would have been wrong about sending her to an Afrocentric school? Well, um, I think it was cheaper tuition. And as all parents, I think you start there. That would have been good. But the other parts, I think like, you know, it's funny. When I wrote that section, I actually imagined that she was going to be in that school longer. And um, when I got her there, and did my sort of campus visit on the page, I realized that there wasn't a lot that we were going to be able to do here. The character who you know she was was not going to work well here. Um, and I was probably reliving my own experiences with that. Did, you, think, did uh, you go to an Afrocentric school? No, but I, I grew up you know, in a period when I was young in the 70s was the tail end of the black power movement and the black arts movement. And Philly was a, you know, had a significant role in that. And when I was going to college, it was the height of the Afrocentric movement. And I think a lot of times when we focus on identity and the positives of identity, and both those movements focus on that, um, there's still times where some people don't fit in completely. I, one time I, I, I had an old girlfriend and she had dreaded up her hair and she was talking to me about how amazing it was to you know claim her identity and stop straightening her hair and and getting these dreads which was all great but in the next sentence she's like and i think you need to get dreads and i was like do you see my hair <laughs> like my hair is straight <laughs> i cannot dread it up and she's like, oh no you can you can get you know this this beeswax and you can use egg whites and you know and and you can do all these things and there was no sense of irony on her part that what she was talking about was the ex- sort of the exact same thing. Well, not the exact same, but but similar as her talking about straightening her hair. And um, to me, that just didn't work. I mean, I, I got really old, basically, before I realized that it wasn't working for me. Black identity, in the way I was thinking about it, wasn't working for me. What was not and working I, about it? Well, it's like every time I had to say I was black, it felt like I was like, you know beheading my father and denouncing his entire family you know and my father you know I love him and I love my family you know my grandparents used to be a huge part of my life and you know part of my connection to Philly it's not just me it's it's an Irish American Philly that went back you know to the 1830s like my humor my sense of humor I have an African American influenced sense of humor probably comes from watching Eddie Murphy tapes and Red Fox and and tapes like that, listening to Bill Cosby tapes. But I also have an Irish-American sense of humor that's dry and self-deprecating and probably fairly bleak (laughs) that I get from my father. (laughs) And so when I was just saying I'm black, it fit, but it didn't really say all of who I was. And it it did feel like I was denying um, my family half of who I was, part of my existence. You you so, create for the daughter in in your novel. You you've created this uh, like biracial school where everybody in it is biracial, and that's their identity. They're not asked to choose the black team or the white team. They identify as biracial. Um, did you have any institution like that in your life ever? Oh no, I didn't hear the word biracial until I was about twenty two. You know, only first time I heard the word biracial was the nineteen ninety two census. I think it was a 92 cents, where people were talking about, we need to be able to knock off more than one box. And so if you're, you're black of mixed heritage, you should be able to knock off more than one box. And I hated that idea. I thought the people that wanted to do that were sellouts, that they were just running away from blackness. And, and I had met people like this, you know, over the years who, you know, they would do anything not to be black. You know, they would swear they were Cherokee. You know, they just happened to be the only curly head, you know, Afro headed Cherokee on earth, but they were (laughs) Cherokee. So I rejected that. Um, So there really, that didn't exist. I mean, you know, I realize now part of my thing was I grew up 10 years too late, you know, or 10 years too early because the the world changed. Um, And really before my period for a very long time in this country, you know, if you were mixed, you were black. And that was the end of the story. Now that was black with an asterisk. You know, and you could be constantly criticized for not being black enough. But still, 
that was the box and you had to go sit in it. So when, you know, that first biracial uh, identity talk started happening around me, I rejected it and it took me a while to see it was real. But even still, like, I love the idea of, of biracial. I actually don't use the word biracial. I tend to use mixed. Uh, biracial to me accentuates the word race and, I, you know, I, I, I don't really care for it. And I use the word mulatto, which gets on everybody's nerves, but it works for me. That's a whole, that's a slave era expression. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of slave era expressions about race we're walking around using every day that nobody seems to mind. So, you know, forgive me if I'm going to take one that works for me. <laughs> <laughs> so as, as you pointed out, a lot of the things that we think of as being racial differences are really class differences in America. And I'm wondering if your parents were from the same class. No. Um, well, my mother was, I think, from a slightly higher class level. My black mother was from a slightly higher class level. In the sense that her dad was a preacher. Her grandfather was a preacher. They had secondary education studies and in, in theology. You know, I have a cousin who's a professor at Yale. I have a cousin who's a CEO on the black side. On the white side, my family was working class probably until the GI Bill. I mean, that's what made the difference. They lived from the 1830s up until the 1940s. Parts of my family lived within the same three blocks in the art museum section of Philly that whole time. And they didn't become upwardly mobile until after World War II. So, you know, yeah, it's a lot more complicated when you start looking closer. So um, how old were you when your parents separated? Uh, I think my parents probably separated when I was about four and they divorced uh, later, but um, I stayed with my mother. It was the 70s. We didn't have, you know, the same sort of uh, co-parenting situations a lot of people have now. So it was every other weekends for a while, and then when I could get to my dad's on my own, every other weekends and Wednesdays. So mostly I was with my mom, um, and mostly I was in, in Germantown and, and also Mount Airy in majority black environments. What was it like for you to go back and forth between not only two different parents, but two different kinds of neighborhoods. Um, was your father living in a predominantly white neighborhood and your mother in a predominantly African-American one? Um, there was points, but mostly my dad was in Germantown. My dad was in Germantown for many years. I mean, Germantown has a very solid white middle-class liberal mm -hmm. population. Mm -hmm. and, and my dad was part of that world, um, you know, with their own scene. You know, I spent many a time at the co-op Weaver's Way bagging <laughs> nuts, <laughs> Yes, you know, so... <laughs> Like that, that was a whole kind of world. And that, and there were a lot of interracial couples in that world. So it wasn't like solidly one or the other, but they were different. And I think at that point later, um, my dad's world tended to be more middle class and educated. My mother was a social worker. And uh, because I was her duty, she didn't have much of a social life. So it was basically just me and her for a long time. Um, and now I take her, take care of her and basically, you know, pay it back now. But I think it was almost easier because they were not together to just be like, I'm going into this mode now. I'm here in this mode and then I'm going to, you know, take the bus and then I'm going to be in this mode. And, you know, I think there was a real disparity probably with the way I presented myself in these places. But I was kind of speaking the cultural language of where I was. What were some you of know? the differences? I think it was largely it was just the way of talking I mean, I see the things the same all the time, but, you know, with my father, I tended to use his accent and his way of looking at the world. My mother cursed a lot, so <laughs> and my mom's it was okay to curse, so, and, you know, that had nothing to do with ethnicity, just my mom used to stub her toe a lot, and that would happen. And then, you know, my dad's, it was much more calmer. I mean, you know, a lot of divorced kids have this. I mean, mine was just accentuated by ethnicity. There, you know, uh, I, I've talked to so many adult children of divorce who look back and go, I don't know how my parents were ever married because they're so different, you know? Um, and I had that kind of in, in spades, but you know, it wasn't until it, because I was in Philly, I wasn't in like real hardcore majority white environments until like college. And I remember going to visit a girlfriend at Lafayette college in upstate Pennsylvania. And there, I came into a room and there was like 200 people and they were all white. And I just started like having a panic attack. I don't know what I thought they were going to do, but I had never seen that many white people in a room together. It was, it was amazing. Uh, I'm sure they were all looking at me and, and wondering why is that white guy sweating so much? But you know, <laughs> it was all perception. I mean, so much of this was just stuff in my head. You know, I think I was probably the biggest culprit in driving myself crazy over this than anybody else.
You wrote a novel that was written in graphic novel form. You, you had an artist collaborating with you on it called Incognito, and it's set in the 1930s, and it's about a light-skinned African-American who goes undercover as a white man in the South to investigate lynchings. Did you ever feel in your own life like you were almost operating undercover when you were in, like, white neighborhoods or, you know, white, predominantly white places? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the Incognito came out of me and my cousin Ben running through you know, Mount Airy, um, imagining that we were, you know, part of the Underground Railroad where we, you know, were secret agents pretending to be um, white so that we could help people escape from slavery. And we were about 10, I think, when we were doing that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's points now. I mean, I don't actively try to pass, but I know my privilege. You know, all this stuff like me, like dealing with the issues I had, uh, the looking the way I did, I mean, they're nothing compared to issues that that many African Americans have to deal with in this country. You know, I got pulled over by the cops on the way to this this interview. <laughs> did you today. really? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, it was completely my fault. <laughs> I, mean, I I didn't update my tags on my car. <laughs> it was no biggie. It was no 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 drunken you know car chase. But it was still you know, it's, it's always scary. You know, and when that cop came to the window, I did my best Caucasian. You know, my grammar was perfect. I did everything I could in that moment to be non-threatening. And I know part of that is not, you know, having him perceive me as black. Because I know that can end up getting me killed. It can. Was the cop so white? I, have to, I didn't know at first. And I was nervous. And he came by and, I, and he was Latino. And I gave a half sigh of relief. You never know. <laughs> you know, uh, I can't see into anybody's head. But I, you know, I, I live with that fear despite the way I look. I mean, when I, you know, when I was home, I get pulled over, but, not, but, and, but I don't think it was for driving while black. I think it was for driving while appearing Puerto Rican. I don't know what the acronym for that is. But uh, so, yeah, I'm, I, there are times where I've, I've had to do that. And I know I've had privilege because of the way I look. Can I ask if your wife is white or black? Yes, you can. And she is black. <laughs> yes, <laughs> She is definitely black. And, and, uh, and uh, my kids are uh, African-American and, uh, you know, but the way they, they look, sometimes they have begun, not, I, it wasn't my impetus, but they have begun telling people they're mixed because when they told people, you know, some of them are, uh, one of them is, is darker and two of them are lighter and all of them meet confusion with people around them. So they've, they've started using mixed because it works for them. And for me, um, the way you tell people who you are in the world, it should match you, you know? So I'm okay with them doing that. I don't want them to try and fit into a name that doesn't match them because invariably they're going to have to end up overcompensating for that. If you're just joining us, my guest is writer Matt Johnson and his new novel is called Loving Day. And Loving Day is... Um, uh, a reference to an actual day of celebration. You want to describe what Loving Day is? Um, yeah, Loving Day is a recent holiday that celebrates uh, Loving versus State of Virginia, which federally legalized interracial marriage throughout the country. Um, it started by um, a guy named Ken Tanabe. He basically just came up with the first idea for it and promoted it, and now people are doing their own Loving Day celebrations across the country. And you'll find people there from you know interracial relationships, you are there kind of, you know, meeting up with other people who have dealt with the same issues. And then you find a lot of people of mixed ancestry there. And I, you know, I didn't know about any of this till I started getting into this world. Um, but that was later. So when you say this world, like there's like a world, like there's a biracial world. Oh yeah. It's a separate planet. <laughs> it's a, it's an ice giant, but yeah, it, you know, a couple of years ago I, I was at this event, right. And I got this vibe from somebody who I, I really felt like it was a black event and I felt like they wanted me to basically compensate for how I looked. Like they wanted to know if I was down, you know, like, okay, yeah, sure. You might have some genetic connection to blackness, but are you really black? And I got that vibe and I've, I've gotten that vibe, you know, my whole life at different points. So I recognize the vibe and I was just like, you know, I'm too old for this. And I just didn't do it. And they kept giving me chances to be like, oh, okay. Like questions like, oh, you know, and so where'd your wife go to school? Like question, they were trying to feel me out and I wouldn't do it. And so afterwards I went to this lounge area and there was a bunch of other, you know, black people there. 
And I talked about it. And all these other people started clicking in and, and saying, you know, I've had that too. Oh, God, I hate that. I hate that. And then at one point, there was about 12 of us. The weird thing was I looked around and I realized every one of us was mixed. Every single one of us. And we were all identifying something that happens to a lot of black people, but happens even more so to mixed people. And that got me on this idea of community. Because almost everything that's been written about mixed experience usually is about the individual. Like, in, you know, the, the archetype with, of the tragic mulatto, like the early uh, novels about mixed identity, they're all about one person. So I really started getting interested both in Loving Day, but also in, in this larger world about what the community of mixed people were. And so I started going to these events to see what, you know, community uh, mixed experience was like. And uh, it turns out they're just people like everybody else. So everybody just gets on my nerves after like 10 minutes, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, <laughs> really like my, my, one of my big struggles, like a lot of writers have this thing between being an introvert and an extrovert, you know, and I have that and I have this, like this feeling of the individual. I'm interested in the individual, but I also get lonely and want my tribes, but invariably, you know, we all seem to get on each other's nerves and then we, you know, disappear and become the individual again. <laughs> So, you know, I enjoyed like, like seeing all these other people and, and interacting with uh, people with this similar issue. But at the same time, I'm really suspicious of groups. Like I'm really suspicious of anybody who comes in and says, this is your identity now, or this is your belief system. And now that you have this, everything's going to be great. And because, you know, initially it does feel great when you make these adjustments and you have this idea of, you you know, euphoric, you know, connection to this new possibilities about yourself. But after a while, the actual regular suffering of human existence still kicks in, you know. So, yeah, it was I, I really enjoy these communities. But at the same time, you know, I'm also suspicious, too, of when we get too attached to communities based around you know, ethnicity or race or, or, um, you know, hardcore belief system. So, um, you mentioned that, you know, your, your mother has like, uh, a sister who converted to Judaism and somebody else yes. who converted for, for marriage, I, I imagine after, after marriage. Um, actually my, my aunt, um, married her husband who was Jewish and raised their kids, but she converted after their divorce. Um, she was just, huh. you know, um, uh, believed, and and was at that point was a you know a part of the the Jewish community in Philly and, and wanted to fulfill that and you know my cousins um, you know are are still part of their Jewish communities and uh, my stepmother is also Jewish so you know I had a lot of those influences around that's really helped kind of with my like you know my basic uh, sense of humor and and probably the way I debate too because I was constantly arguing with my cousins. So did having a stepmother who or does is your father still alive? Yeah, yeah. And your, your stepmother too? Still living off of Valley Green Park with my stepmother for oh, you know, okay. all this time. So so your yeah. st- so your stepmother is Jewish. Has having a Jewish stepmother introduced like a whole different culture into your identity and into your just kind of like knowledge? Oh yeah. I mean, you know, the weird thing is, right, when you say who you are, there's first there's you have to have an actual ancestral claim, right? A genetic claim. But then you also have to have a community that thinks you're that thing um, and a real connection to the community. And then you actually have to believe you're that thing. And the weird thing is like with the Jewish part, I have no ancestral claim or thought I didn't. It turns out my DNA test says I have a very minor one. But that was just a huge part. And and uh, like I, I grew up not seeing the boundaries between things. And one of the places that I saw blurred boundaries that other people didn't was in humor. And, um, you know, the African-American tradition, the Irish-American tradition and the Jewish-American tradition are all incredibly steeped in humor, you know, because all of them came up with humor as a coping mechanism for oppression. So to me, that was the universal language. And it was also like, you know, the way I can actually express myself in all those worlds and be heard. You know, an interesting difference between African-American humor and Jewish humor and it's kind of, um, I don't know, basic or maybe most stereotype form is uh, African-American humor. Some of it comes out of playing the dozens in which you insult the other person or insult the other person's mother. And so much of Jewish humor is like you're insulting yourself. It's like totally self-deprecating. Right. 
Right. Yeah. Um, and I think, but the key there is is a defensive posture, right? Um, like either way, cases, right? They're both defensive. Either way, you're trying yeah. not to get beat up, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that's at the heart of it, you know? Um, so yeah, it, they, you, you had them both there. It, it's, it's funny because, um, if you actually listen to it, a lot of it ends up being self-deprecating. I mean, the act of sitting there and talking with somebody who's going to be insulting your mother, you know, is <laughs> the actual act is in some ways self-deprecating. So, you know, so so all those kind of things were were there. And you, I mean, you look at the comedy circuit in America. That's the two major traditions. You know, the Jewish American comedic tradition and the African American comedic tradition. You know, so um, they're all influencing each other. I mean, you, Seinfeld talks about how Cosby influenced him. You know, and all these people are going back and forth. They're playing the same circuits. So I think, you know, you want to talk about a mulatto experience. Look at the way uh, we laugh in America. And it's right there. You know, we've spent so much time during this interview talking about your experiences um, being of mixed ancestry. You know, your, your, your mother black, your father white, you looking, your skin color looking, you know, very light. And some people mistakenly assuming that you are just white. And I'm just thinking, hearing you talk, how exhausting that must be to always feel like people are, are waiting for you to explain yourself, to explain like who yeah. you are, that like just being isn't good enough. Like you have to, you have to choose a team. You have to explain you who you are. You have to explain why you look the way you do. You have to explain that so people accept you. You have to explain that so that you don't get beaten up by the wrong, <laughs> the wrong people. Yeah. You have to explain that so that you can be on certain panel discussions or not be on certain panel discussions. Yeah. It sounds just utterly exhausting. Yeah, I mean, it sucks. I mean, there's worse identity <laughs> issues to have, but it, it just sucks. I mean, you know, one of the things, like when I did this comic Incognito, right, um, you know, it's about this guy who pretends to be white to, to investigate lynchings, but as loosely based on, on Walter White. But um, once I did it, I would show up at the bookstore and I noticed they weren't looking at me funny anymore. You know, my first two novels were, you know, marketed just as African-American novels. And then I'd show up and they'd be like, okay, are you the driver? You know? And all of a sudden people saw me, you know, like they saw me. I didn't have to explain anything. So I was just like, whoa, you know, this might be something to further investigate. And I did think like in part with Loving Day, you know, I am tired of talking about this. It really feels like I'm walking around all day with an uh, ink stain in my breast pocket. You know, that ink stain might be four years old. But every time I walk down the hall, somebody's like, hey, you know, you got an ink stain in your pocket. It's, it's I, 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 you know, it's unbelievably exhausting. So part of this for me, like I, I gave my first reading last night and I told him like, this is the book. This book is being born today. It was the day it came out. But for me, it's the funeral for this book. And it's the funeral for having to talk about these issues. Like I needed to say them. I needed to get them all out on paper, but I don't need to keep them with me forever. I like, I want to put them in the pages of the book, close the book and keep it, uh, you know, at your local library where I don't have to carry this stuff anymore. Matt Johnson, it's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Matt Johnson is the author of the new satirical novel, Loving Day, which was just published in paperback. Our interview was first broadcast last year when the book was published in hardcover. I'm happy to say that since then, Matt Johnson has become a Fresh Air contributor. I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air.